Daniela had the brilliant idea because we really want to reach out in Vienna to all types of different institutions. And I don't think that in Vienna people quite understand how willing and open we are to all types of collaborations. But when Daniela said the Zina we had him on, on, on Skype and he knew what you know, it was like in tears. He'd been collecting Zinagnaven albums for years. And don't think it has been, you know, incredible <coughs> scholars of classical music and uh, done many, many classical music projects together. And in fact, our Victoria's a virtue also on the piano. And when we were yesterday at the Zinagnaven rehearsal, when he sat down at the piano, the top headmaster turned around and was really surprised and he's a more from the role of boys from Iceland who really produced great classical music. So um, I think I would like to pass uh, the microphone so, to Daniela because she does have um, a much profounder insight into this, but I just wanted to to bring in this aspect of, of working with the Sinek Calvin. I mean, it was incredible to me when they accepted to um, perform in our opening. Um, it took a tremendous amount of effort to convince the media that this was true, because I think it's so unlikely in Vienna that such a historically classical institution, such as theirs, would think of even collaborating with us. So. <laughs> the performance piece got a little bit delayed. Ragnar is so successful that he cannot. Has so many other things to do that he actually called us and said, I'm so sorry, I think I need another year. Um, but it's a well spent year. It will be, I hope, another wonderful, wonderful piece. So as we were holding this date, uh, for the opening of the performance. Um, we are saying, well, what about using the date and actually preluding the performance with uh, the visitors, uh, which is a work the foundation had recently acquired. It is a wonderful work, a masterpiece, and it works so extremely well uh, in this particular setting for various, various reasons. So this is a little bit of introduction to why you see the work here today and how sort of this spontaneous decision of shifting gears came about and how also we're promising to not only have this sort of debut but kind of re-enter and uh, re-accelerate this working relationship with Wagner over the last couple, probably two or three years. Uh, because we will start with this exhibition, then we'll have a performance, and the performance will most likely end up being the filmic work, which then again will um, hopefully be shown here, or uh, definitely in this city. Um, the piece with the Zenith now was sheer luck. Um, I, we were obviously actually just thinking that we would premiere the piece here. We had three weeks to do that. It was all done, as I just said, in a very, very short uh, time frame. But then, again, ambition is stronger than the flesh. And we said, oh, yes, a little performance would be something, you know, just to make it even <coughs> more interesting. And uh, due to the neighborhood of Zegatnam and your ongoing and strong passion, um, Ragnar immediately said, I know exactly what we're going to do. It's very, very simple. And so what we'll see tonight is one line of the lyrics uh, of the visitors taken out and rearranged and sung again in the 20-minute loop by the Haydn uh, uh, Choir, the Haydn Choir of the Sanger Town, uh, in a one-time only performance tonight. And it's a piece dedicated to the stars exploding. Yeah. This house on uh, in Rockaway and on in upstate New York, and it has been, yeah, I've, I was there the first time in 2007, and then I stayed there a month, and and, and like, yeah, yeah, kind of all the elements in it, they, yeah, they are, they, yeah, they they are somewhat personal. Like it starts. With that, I got to know these people who have this beautiful house that is the piece called Rokabi Farm, and 
The house was built in 1813 by a man called John Armstrong, who was in Washington's army. And like still lying around the house, it's like it's blue, she played in the war of, you know, it's in the war of, uh, what is it called, the big, big war of independence? The, the late 18th century, like, you know. And, and it's just full of instruments and artworks, and that became the, the home of the Astors. Like, the, the, the Astors went into the family, so it became this. Your golden age, your gilded age palace in upstate New York. And in 1870, like the, uh, the, the, like there was, in 1870, they, there was two people that died in this house. And the house was being the same, just not, not a lot of people died. It was a, it was the, it was the, Daughter of John Jacob Astor and her husband, they died after they got pneumonia from being in his in his funeral so long. <laughs> <laughs> he was a great man. He wanted a long funeral, <laughs> <laughs> and his daughter died after it. Yeah, and her, and her husband, and they had like five orphans. Then, so they were like called the Astor orphans, and. And that one of those orphans was Ricky's grandmother. And Rick, Ricky is the guy who was who was shoots the cattle. Uh -huh. And uh, and so so that and she like you know was just five years old when her parents died, like in 1878, something like that. Then she lived until 1969. Everything had to be just like Mama and Papa had it. Uh -huh. So so the house is exactly the same. And, and now the family is, you know, has become like this. Uh, it's it's hippie, hippie like sick, sick, Yeah, like kind of like you know they are they're just struggling to keep the place up and and they are like very kind of bohemian and like Anya who's there in the choir she she uh, is a shaman like a, a paganist shaman. That's how I got to know them because my friend Marcus was a nice to be curator was studying at CCS Park. And he's a shame too. No, yeah. <laughs> but the, she asked him, like, say, oh, there's an Iceland there in the, the park. Like, the, an Iceland must know how to do, like, a pagan, you know, <laughs> Nordic pagan ritual. And he's, like, the straightest guy you can imagine. He's like, yes, that's Google's pagan rituals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he did the big ritual, and then they became friends, and then this all happened. So, but there's also like this element of paganism in it, which I really like. It's like this. Uh, it's like also like the then the, the lyrics with the feminine ways. Once again, I fall into my feminine ways. It's always like you know that that you know what do they say that paganism is more feminine than our uh, what do you, what do you, what's it called the negative one? Monotheism. Monotheism, yeah. So. It's a difficult concept. Yeah, but it's a male god. It's a male god, yeah. <laughs> so, but that, that's like, it's funny, like, you know, like, 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 so, so, like, the paganists in Rockaby, they pull me out to look at the face, like, yeah, it's like a satanistic paganist face. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so. But there, there is also one deity that is a Hasidic Jew. From the family, no? Yeah, yeah, there's one. Yeah, there's one from the family. The Caesar. Or Kabbalist. Uh, yeah, yeah, she's a yeah, she's a Hasidic Jew, and the mother, yeah, like the daughter is a Hasidic Jew. The mother is a paganist, and the father he's like a Satanist. He, the father is like no. <laughs> he just says he's an old school, you know, very Republican. So <laughs> they fight all the time. That's also why they welcome the visitors because they. Said like you know if you're not here we're just fighting. <laughs> <laughs> so and then the, the family is there on the porch with in the, the they have the choir which is on the porch and then all the musicians they were my old uh, like kind of my dear friends from the Reykjavik music scene it's kind of like it's almost like a, it's almost like my gang it's like a good thing <laughs> and and they and we had never played. Together until we, we once we were like when I had an opening here at the Babak, 
then uh, then the Brazilian hook C asked me to bring a band, and then I then I assembled this band together. So it's kind of it's all coming full circle, and the, now the band <laughs> is is coming here to uh, to Vienna in this in this. It starts your work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the thing is shot like that, but it's nine cameras, nine microphones, and nine different spaces in the big old rocket we matched. So was it all recorded at the same time? It was all recorded at the same time. Okay. It was also this, this is like it's a... a single, it's one single shot. Yeah. It's one, nine, okay. okay. One shot, one take, 64 minutes straight. Yeah. And then synchronized by your ears in the space. So the channels are not mixed. Yeah, uh, when you have asked if we're interested in, in cooperating in this project, there's for me always the first aspect is uh, is it an artistically interesting project? Of course, that's one question. And the second one is it's uh, an interesting project from the pedagogical point of view, and both of them uh, have to fit together. And uh, so after I had a chance to get some information and looking at different uh, aspects of the project, I thought it would be very interesting for us as an organization. Um, I don't know if you know that we are continuously, continuously doing uh, projects uh, with artists, uh, contemporary artists. For example, we just uh, did a children's opera just a few weeks ago by a living composer and many other projects that are uh, cooperation of uh, artists from different parts of the world uh, because of, we think it's very important for the boys to, to get a very wide spectrum. Uh, of interaction. Or for example, in May we do a project with artists from India together. So I think, uh, but this project is very special in many ways. Number one, it's uh, at least to my knowledge uh, the first project where we work together with uh, an artist that's not uh, not only a composer or not only a uh, visual artist, but a combination of many things, and that's made that makes it especially interesting. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing, and I think one of the main reasons why voice choir, not only the Vienna voice choir, but also other voice choir, is so popular in the world, is because we work together with children. Yeah. And of course, at the highest possible level, whatever is possible, uh, but it's still children that are on stage and singing. And, and this innocence of the children, especially through this music, has yeah. a very interesting combination. Absolutely. And it's, I think it's always, uh, in many projects, interesting to have philosophical aspects yes. done by children because it becomes a very yes. different idea of something. Yeah.